the war to end all wars had run its course. Right across America and Europe, people poured out onto the streets in a spontaneous eruption of joy and delirium at the end of this terrible conflict. Peace would bring its own problems soon enough. But for a time, the only concern was to bring the boys home, out of the hell and havoc of Northern Europe, to a hero's welcome. Bands and parades and the arms of their loved ones. This demobilization also applied to Whitehall, to the men of room 40, who had fought their war with pen and paper behind closed doors. A few stayed on to form the nucleus of a future intelligence unit, but most returned to the dreaming spires of Oxford and Cambridge from which they'd been recruited. They were sworn to secrecy, never to talk about their wartime activities or to reveal any part of their knowledge of the German codes. No one broke that oath. But rank hath privilege. The first sea lord, the highest ranking British admiral, Jackie Fisher, couldn't resist telling the secrets he knew of Room 40 in his book of memoirs published in 1920. Never one to be outdone, Winston Churchill, the ex-first lord of the Admiralty, joined in with his bestseller, The World in Crisis, published in 1923. In it, he gave an embellished and colourful account of the capture of the German cruiser Magdeburg and the German naval code books in 1914. Churchill's revelations were a complete disaster. The German high command fought the entire war convinced their codes were utterly secure. They had no idea. The British code breakers, the men of Room 40, were reading their most secret signals. To learn that in the aftermath of an abject national surrender aroused a storm of anger amongst the entire German military hierarchy. They determined it would never happen again. They went on a quest for the unbreakable cipher system. The first clues to the success of their search were picked up in, of all places, Poland, a country that throughout European history has been constantly preyed on and overrun by its two powerful neighbours, Russia and Germany. Poland was a country with very limited manpower and outdated military equipment. Polish generals knew that if attacked, to have any chance at all, they would have to position their armed forces with speed and foresight. And for that to happen, they had to be able to predict their enemy's intentions. To that end, they had developed one of the finest code-breaking organisations in the whole of Europe. In 1920, for example, Polish army codebreakers had broken the Russian codes. And as a consequence, despite being outnumbered and outgunned, they were able to repel a Russian invasion. But the Russians were not the only enemy at the gates. The shadow of Germany's resurgent military power cast a gloom over the country. The codebreakers in 1920s Warsaw focused on the German military codes with great success. They were able to read much of the German army signals traffic on a daily basis, all the way through the decade following the end of the Great War. Then suddenly, on July the 15th, 1928, the German signals changed abruptly. It was as if a shutter had come down. The messages became unreadable. The Polish codebreakers tried everything they knew, but without success. They guessed the Germans had introduced what they'd long been fearing, namely a multi-layered system of ciphers produced entirely by a machine. Now, theoretically, that was unbreakable. To understand how it works, we have to know something about codes and ciphers. Military code books work in very much the same way as telephone directories. Thousands of ordinary words and phrases are replaced by groups of numbers or letters that in themselves are meaningless. You can only read the encoded message if you have the code book to look up the groups to find out what they represent. So every single unit of an army or air force has to have the code book. The weakness with codes is if just one code book falls into the hands of the enemy, they can immediately decode every message they intercept. Ciphers are totally different from codes and much, much harder to crack because they work on the basis of replacing every single letter of every word with a substitute letter or figure you replace the normal alphabet with what's called a cipher alphabet. Roman commanders like Julius Caesar, for example, often sent their reports to Rome in simple transposition ciphers, where the normal alphabet is displaced by, say, five letters to create what is known as the cipher alphabet in which the message is written. 
In the 30s, many army commands on manoeuvres use cipher alphabets based on so-called keywords, normally words that are easy to remember so they don't have to be written down. They can be changed every day or even more frequently by word of mouth, without a vulnerable piece of paper being sent out. So here, for example, the keyword is Achtung. The letter H is therefore represented in the cipher alphabet by the letter A. But if any of these simple ciphers were used for secret military commands, they would be broken in a matter of minutes by professional code breakers. What the German high command was looking for was an unbreakable system. A system might create thousands or even millions of cipher alphabets, one laid on top of another so that the code breakers might never untangle its complexities. And even if they did, it would all be far too late to be of use. In the 1920s, a machine had been invented in Germany that could do just that. It was given the name Enigma, which means an unbreakable puzzle. There had never been anything like it before in the realm of codes and ciphers. The power of the Enigma machine lay in the maze of electrical wiring inside the rotor wheels. The rotors were made of discs of insulating material with a ring of 26 contacts around the rim. Each letter was wired through to a different letter on the other side. And the three rotors were each wired completely differently. They were also geared in such a way that when one rotor had moved through 26 positions, the next wheel was nudged forward one letter. But it didn't end there. An end disc reflected the electrical signal back through the rotor wheels in a totally different alphabetical pathway. Then on the front of the machine, they added a plug board to further complicate the circuitry. These devices multiplied the potential cipher alphabets available to several millions. So when the operator pressed the letter A on the keyboard, an electrical current flowed through the complex maze of wiring in the plug board and the rotor wheels to light up the code letter on the illuminated panel. At the battlefront, the operator removed the rotor wheels and shuffled them several times a day, initially from a group of five, later on from no less than eight wheels. So Enigma's great strength was that even if a machine were captured by the enemy, it was virtually useless unless they knew precisely which rotors were being used, in which order, and at what settings. This is an actual German Enigma cipher machine. The keyboard, which was used to put in the letters, and an illuminable panel here, which the output letters would show up on as you encipher the message. And of course, I must make clear that if I'm putting a message into code, using an Enigma machine, the person who's receiving this message must have an identical Enigma machine, identically set up to take the message out of code. To put a message into Enigma cipher, the Enigma operator first had to choose three code wheels from the eight later on that were available, put these wheels on their shaft in a particular order, then put the wheels into the machine, add these so-called plugs to a particular position, also prearranged, close, uh, close the cover, and then begin, for sometimes after some additional complications, begin enciphering by pressing letters of the message on the keyboard. The Polish code breakers were at their wit's end. By a remarkable series of cloak and dagger operations, they managed to obtain early versions of the Enigma machine. So at least they understood the principles on which it worked. But that didn't help them to break the messages produced on a daily basis by the German army because they didn't know how the machine was set up. Now, to tackle that problem, they set out on a seemingly impossible journey, namely to create a mathematical model of the entire Enigma machine. They recruited a brilliant group of three young German-speaking mathematicians from Poznan University. Jerzy Rozicki, who was noted for his remarkable flashes of inspiration, and Henrik Sigalski, and Marian Rejoyski, both extremely gifted analysts. These men were the pioneers in a battle to solve the puzzle of Enigma that would go on for the next 15 years and involve some of the finest brains in the world. The Polish trio began the fearsome task of constructing a mathematical model of the military Enigma rotor wiring. By 1931, the Poles had made some progress, but then there was an offer of help from the least expected source, from Germany itself. The offer came via this man, Captain Gustave Bertrand of the French service Ronsignement, 
or military intelligence. In 1932, a German had walked into his office offering to sell his services as a spy. Now, Bertrand knew only too well that in the long history of espionage, there were remarkably few walk-ins, as they were called, and they seemed to come in two categories, either those wanting to exploit their position for money, or, far more dangerously, those intent upon working as double agents, spies working for both sides. He had to know as soon as possible which category this man fitted into. This is the man Bertrand saw. He gave himself the gloomy codename of Asher, or Ashes, and very quickly he made his intentions clear. Asher told Bertrand he had access to highly classified documents, which he wished to trade for cash. They followed a series of meetings in several cities throughout Europe. The material Asher supplied was high grade. But on a certain date in 1932, he produced one of the highest classified documents ever traded in the entire history of espionage. Nothing less than the complete instruction manual for the field operation of the German Army Enigma machine. Asher was paid the princely sum of 10,000 German marks about a million dollars at today's values for this priceless document. Now, French intelligence had been working very closely with the Poles on this crucial problem of Enigma. At that time, British codebreakers didn't work with anyone on these matters, perhaps because they regarded themselves already as being the best codebreakers in the world. But they paid very dearly for their pride. A copy of this priceless German manual was sent immediately to Warsaw in the diplomatic bag. British codebreakers did not receive a copy. With the aid of the manuals which Asher had provided, the Poles were able at last to make progress. They began to crack some Enigma encrypted messages. They even created a truly revolutionary machine, a sort of primitive counting machine that was able to spin through the possible key positions of the Enigma rotors in hours, instead of the days and weeks it would have taken Polish codebreakers to do it manually. But time was running out. Hitler was impatient. The Germans entered the Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia, on the pretext of a request from its German-speaking population. No one called Hitler's bluff. The Germans had already occupied Austria, with scarcely a shot being fired. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, flew to Hitler's mountain retreat at Berchtesgaden in the German Alps in a desperate attempt to craft a peace, even a phony peace. The world held its breath. Was Europe to be plunged into war for the second time in a generation? I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. The message of peace in our time was as frail as the paper it was written on. The summer of 1938, German troops exercise on the Polish frontier. Hitler demanded the return of lost German territory in Poland. Even at this 11th hour, the hope was that Hitler was playing at brinkmanship, that his bluff could be called. Brilliant Polish codebreakers sweated for every last scrap of information that would reveal his true intentions. Then suddenly, on the 15th of December, 1938, their world went black again. They could no longer read the torrent of Enigma messages sent to German troops on their very borders. The Germans had simply exploited the fiendish power of the Enigma machine. They'd added two more rotors. So now operators in the field could choose at random any three rotor wheels from this package of five. 
This was an immense increase in complexity, and it was also the end of the road for the Polish codebreakers. They just had time to pass on their knowledge and their methods to French and British intelligence before the lightning struck. It was Blitzkrieg or Lightning War, a wholly new form of warfare, more violent than anything the world had ever seen. Planes and tanks and motorized infantry falling upon the enemy in a series of irresistible hammer blows, sweeping all before them, giving no time for the opposing forces to regroup or gather their senses. They were simply wiped out or swept aside. At its heart lay the power of Enigma. Bombers, and tanks and infantry units were all closely coordinated by a constant flow of messages and position reports wrapped in the secret Enigma ciphers. The enemy was blind and had no knowledge of where the next blow would fall. Poland fell in two weeks. Then the Low Countries in a matter of days. in France.
across the land, where their fathers had lain mired in mud for years on end, the German tanks now raced at breakneck speed, sweeping all before them. In just six weeks, the German armies had reached the Channel coast at Dunkirk and virtually destroyed the entire French army and the British expeditionary force. It was a devastating display of military power, coordinated by a seemingly impenetrable cipher system. It seemed invincible, unstoppable. To rub salt into the wounds, Hitler received the surrender of France in exactly the same railway carriage as Germany had surrendered at Versailles in 1918. He now ruled Europe from the Atlantic coast to the Urals. Britain stood alone, the remnant of its forces that had escaped the German onslaught demoralized and disarmed. As the Battle for Britain drew near, Winston Churchill marshaled some of the most gifted British linguists and mathematicians at a secret country house outside London. For the embattled island to survive, they had to break the enigma. The Battle of France was over. The Battle of Enigma had begun. A battle the codebreakers had to win. <laughs> 